Well, I'm going to open a story in the Bible that's found in two kings. It's a story, actually, of a woman that we don't even know her name. It's found in 2 Kings 4, and she's the unnamed woman. And I even like that about the beginning of this story, because in a church of this size, in a campus of this size, you can also almost feel unnamed. You can feel like you've just blended in this morning. Maybe you came in and sat at the back or sat over at the side, and you kind of feel like, well, I'm here, but nobody really knows anything about me. Well, let me tell you, friend, that you don't need people to know your name because God's got, only got your name, but he's got your number. <laughs> God doesn't just know who you are. He knows whose you are. He knows all about you. He formed you. He knows exactly what you're going through. And so when we open the word, whether you feel known or unknown, the word is a revealer of all of our lives. God is speaking to every situation today. And this woman is a woman that went on a journey, and I want us to follow her journey for a little while, because her journey took her, I believe, through three little uh, stages that she went through that I think are identification blocks for where you might find yourself today. I kind of want this word to be a, a, a GPS to your life this morning. Some of you have got maybe lost on the journey in life. Some of you are in a season in your life today where you're slightly confused as to how you got there or why you're there. Maybe your journey doesn't look like you thought that it should look like. Maybe there are things in your life that you're handling right now that you're not even sure why you're handling it or how it came about. Well, this morning, my prayer is that through this woman's life, we would learn some clarity for the stage we're in, and we would learn some wisdom for how to move forward to the next phase that God has for our life. Amen? The stages that I want to talk about through her story, are, I'm going to call them doorways, hallways and gateways. Doorways, hallways, and gateways. I believe that many of you are going to locate yourself in one of these places through the course of this message. And when you do locate yourself, just have a little aha moment on your own in your chair and go, I think you just found me, God. I am busted. Now help me get to the next stage, okay? That's what I'm asking for. This woman clearly lived a life and she was prosperous. Her husband was doing well and they were home and they had no family. It was something that had never happened for them. And I don't know whether she felt she had time on her hands, but there was a guy that came through town. He was a prophet of God. And the story goes that she said to her husband one day, maybe because they'd never filled the nursery, maybe because they'd never had a child, she said, you know, we've got a spare room in our house. And this man of God keeps coming through town. And I would like to make the spare room a place for him to stay. I'd like to create some room for this man of God to stay in our home whenever he goes through town. And so she nipped down to Ikea and she picked up some Swedish furniture and she did the room out and she said, you know what, I'll just let him know he's welcome. And the space that she created invited this man of God into their home. And I just even want to stop just there, just for a second to say, some of you cannot hear God because you have not cleared any space in your life for him recently. Some of you don't hear the voice of God because you can't remember the last time you cleared out the room to let him speak into your life. And there's going to be some seasons in your life where you really need to just go back home, clear some space, make some room, and invite God's voice in, in a deliberate way to your circumstance, and kick some other voices out of your life that are taking the space that God alone should be given. And she cleared some space for this man of God. And because she cleared some space, God was about to speak. And some of you are like, oh, God speak. He's like, if I could find some room in your life, you'd find I'm speaking loud and clear. So maybe you just need to go home right there on point one and clear some space. She cleared some space. The man of God was in their house. And because he was in their house, he had on, their ha on his heart to bless this woman back. And so it says in verse 11, of 2 Kings 4, it says, One day when Elisha came, he went up to his room and he lay down there. And he said to his servant Gehazi, I call the Shamanite. So he called her and she stood before him. And Elisha said to him, Tell her, you have gone to all of this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? Let me just stop right there. I love the word of God. I stop all the time when I read, as you're probably going to find out. It's just too good. There's something in every line. I want to say to some of you in there here and in the other campuses, God's doing the exact same thing to you right now. He's saying to you, he's calling you and he's saying, you have been so good to me. You have given, you have worshipped, you have served 
You've been faithful. You've been trustworthy. What can I do for you? God wants to say back to some of you in this room, what can I do for you? And some of you are like, oh, no, no, I'm good. I got it, God. I got a plan. I got a retirement plan. I got a good job. I've taken care of the college for the kids. I'm good, God, because you are not good at receiving. But some of you need to know God wants to take you into a season where you receive. You learn how to receive. Even though it might be uncomfortable, you learn to say, thank you, God. I receive what it is you're wanting to give to my life. I receive some of your great givers. But great givers, the Bible says, will also need to become great receivers. Because as you sow, you will reap, whether you like it or not. So I just say, just say, amen, bring it on, Jesus. Thank you very much is now our response that we need to get used to. And I know that's harder for some than others. But basically he was saying, because you've been good to me, I want to be good to you. So he says, call her and she comes and he says, what can we do? And Gehazi says, well, she is without a son and her husband is old. And so he has an idea. Elisha calls her and says, stand in the doorway. Everybody say doorway. I said, everybody say doorway. All together or not at all. Thank you very much. (laughs) Doorway. She stands in the doorway. And in the doorway, this is what he says. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. Listen to her response. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no, my Lord, she objected. Please, man of God. Don't mislead your servant. The New Living Translation says that she said, oh no, man of God, don't please get my hopes up. Here's a place where some of you are gonna locate yourself today. You're in a doorway. And what I mean by that is that God is calling you to stand in a place where he wants to speak to you about things that you have shoved in your attic spiritually. Dreams that you have boxed up and you have put away because they did not happen on your time scale. They did not happen how you thought they would happen. And he wants to speak to you about some things that you have hidden away and put away because you're like, I can't get my hopes up about that anymore. I can't get my hopes up anymore about my son coming back to God. I can't get my hopes up anymore about my marriage being better than it is right now, so I'm just going to cope. I can't get my hopes up about getting that promotion or that job. I can't get my hopes up about having the baby that we prayed for so long and so hard. She was in a place where the baby that they'd once desired, she'd said, you know what? We tried, we believed, it didn't happen. And somewhere she had gone away and she had packaged up that dream and she had placed it in the attic of her life. And now she was in a doorway and the man of God said to her what she would not articulate, the thing that is your hidden desire is the thing God's going to give you. And her response was, oh no, please don't. Don't make me hope again. Don't, don't string me along. I'm not sure I could handle it. And some of you right now today, God is saying that thing, right, that thing, that thing you wrote down years ago, that, that relationship that's broken, that family that has been broken apart through betrayal. I know you think it's too far gone, but would you bring it back down out of the attic? Because my word will be the final word. I will have the final say, but you're gonna have to stand in a doorway and go and retrieve your dream. So she stands in the doorway and she opens the box of possibility back up. You know, I remember when we were told we would never have children. And we tried for over five years and we went through the process. There were many times when I was ready to put the box back in the attic and say, I can't do this. It's too hard. It's too emotionally draining. Let's not get our hopes up. But now with two children growing and raised, we're raising two great kids and the miracle of what God did. I'm so glad that at one point I was willing to go stand back in the doorway and let God speak into my spirit again. You have no idea what God will do if you'll stand in his doorway. Man of God, do not give up your dream. Woman of God, do not lay down in disappointment. Do not say it's over if God has not said it is over. So maybe your location today is a doorway. And if it is, be strong, be open, be willing. But what I've discovered is that doorways lead to hallways. Everybody said amen. (laughs) You need to say amen now because when I explain the hallway, you're not going to want to say amen. (laughs) I've yet to go through a door that doesn't lead me to a corridor. 
It's going somewhere, but you don't quite know yet where it's going. You have to walk from the doorway entrance point down the hallway to get to the next entrance point. And we don't like hallways. <laughs> but I found in God that he gives us quite a few. And I've also found that he does short hallways, long hallways, and really long hallways. <laughs> This woman was about to go down a hallway. She was going to receive her miracle, but her miracle of her son was going to take her in a hallway of a challenge that she didn't even comprehend she was built to go through. The story goes that after the miracle baby arrives and he grows, that actually tragedy in the hallway happens. And one day as the boy is out in the field with his father, he says, my head, my head, verse 21. And so the servant lifts the boy and carries him to his mother. And the boy sits on her lap until noon, and then he dies. I mean, this is the very reason why she said, don't get my hopes up. This is the very reason why she was not willing to go into the doorway, because God, I can't control what comes next. And some of us are glorified control freaks. <laughs> and God is after taking the control out of your hands so that you can see all control will stay in his hands. You might not understand the season you're in. She was about to go through a very confusing season. And some are not in the doorway, but you are in the hallway. And you're more confused than you are clear. You're more misunderstood than you are understood. You're not sure what's going on, just like she wasn't. But here's what I want you to see. She's about to walk her hallway, and she's about to do it with great style. And I think we should learn from some things that you do in the hallway and some things, therefore, that you don't do in your hallway. I reckon this chick went to the same high school as me because she clearly had some rules that she abided by when she was walking this corridor. And they were very much like the rules that I was given at school when I was growing up. We had rules in our hallways at school. Our school was an old building. The hallways were extremely narrow. And so just for the sake of health and safety and people movement, there were some rules that we were given. And the first rule of our hallway was you are not allowed to take your bags down the hall with you. If you brought a rucksack to school or a lunchbox to school, it had to be locked away in your locker. You could not carry unnecessary things with you down the hallway because lots of baggage would block the hallway, which means people could not keep moving through. And you know, spiritually, it's exactly the same rule in God's hallways. If you're in a season right now of transition, if you're in a season right now where you're going from one thing to the next, if there are things happening right now that you can't actually articulate or understand, you need to know God's rule is no baggage in the hallway. You're in a season right now where you're going from one thing to the next. If there are things happening right now that you can't actually articulate or understand, you need to know God's rule is no baggage in the hallway. <laughs> and you know what? She knew that rule. You know how I know it? Because the boy dies. I mean, talk about a moment of confusion. Talk about a moment when you could go into full-on panic. But here's what she did. It says she got the boy, verse 21, when he died, his body, and she took him and she laid him on the bed of the man of God and she shut the door. In other words, the thing that had died, the thing that was confusing, the thing that she could not understand was going on, she decided, I'm going to pick up this situation. I'm going to pick up this problem and I'm going to take this problem right the way back to the place of promise. I'm going to take my problem to the place where the promise was made that I would have a son. I'm going to take my distress and put it on the place where I saw hope. I'm going to take what happened that I don't understand back to the place where there was clarity and I did understand. And we have to learn to pick up the dead thing, to pick up the broken thing, to pick up the betrayal, whatever it is in your life. And instead of doing drama, hello, I mean, this is biblical proof that some women can do life without drama. And all the men said, amen. She was a drama. That's the biggest amen I've had so far, by the way. She was a drama-free chick. What we do is when something goes wrong is we pick it up and we're like, ah! I need prayer. I need the pastor. I need 
everybody, everybody needs to know. I need to go on social media about this. I need to tell everyone. I'm going to Instagram it, Periscope it, Twitter it, Twitter it again. They betrayed me. They hurt me. Do you see what they did? Look at my wounds. Look at my scars. I mean, I have been treated so badly. Everybody needs to know. Look at my big baggage. Some of you, you're going around with your baggage on show. But let me just tell you, while you're going around with your baggage on show, you ain't getting any further down your hallway. You're delaying your own destiny. You're holding up around an issue that you need to move on from. And I just love the fact that in her clearly emotional state, she had the presence of mind to pick it up, take it to the place of promise, lay it down, shut the door, and say, I don't know what's going on right now, but I'm going to go find a man that knows what to do. Are you carrying baggage today in your hallway? It's time to lock it away. Until God speaks over it, and until God is ready to move in it, stop carrying it around. It's weighing you down. It's not helping you move forward, and it's making you more confused than you need to be. When she'd laid the baggage down, she clearly knew the second rule too. Because the second rule looks like this. It says her husband said, she called her husband and said, can you send me one of the servants and a donkey because I'm going to go to the man of God quickly and then I'll return. Her husband says, well, why are you going to him today? He just thinks the boy has a headache. Why are you going to him today, he asks. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. Listen to her answer. It's all right. It wasn't all right. Okay, it was far from all right. The boy had died. But when he says to her, what's going on? She's like, it's cool. <laughs> because the second rule of the hallway is no talking in the hallways. <laughs> no talking in the hallways. Stop chit-chatting in the hallways. I would be told off all the time at high school for talking in the hallways. I would hear, show up. And I would know I've been busted for having a conversation with a friend in the hallway. Here's what I know about hallway conversations. Oftentimes when you're in a season of life that you don't know really what everything is going on and you're in transition and things are changing, you know what? You can find that you want to talk, but you're not in the right place to talk. I mean, like you're confused and sometimes you're mad. And you know what, there's nothing wrong with those feelings. I mean, we're all human beings, no one's perfect. Sometimes you're like upset or you feel betrayed or you feel like that wasn't fair or I was overlooked or I was mistreated or that business deal and the way they handled me. And in the hallway, it's so tempting as someone passes you to say, let me just tell you about this. But what I found is that conversations in the hallway, because hallways are places of movement, they travel with whoever you tell them. Unless you know that you know that you know you want that person in your business, you're better being quiet in the hallway. Some of you are having coffee mornings in the hallway. God's like, no, I need you in this time to trust me. And I need you in this time to hold your peace. I need you in this time to keep moving. And those conversations are holding you back. And they're confusing you even more. It's time to be quiet in the hallway. She carries on down the hallway and it says that she tells her husband, it's okay, and then she says this, get me a donkey, and then she says to the guy, let's go, let's ride him, cowboy. She was a good old Texan roots. <laughs> She's one of your ancestors. <laughs> I reckon this chick had spurs on her boots. There was something about her in this moment where she was like, I am going to get the man of God. Don't stop, don't slow down. If I look like I'm falling off, don't worry, I'll cling on. I am going to the answer. I am going to my future. And she put her spurs on and she said, ride them, cowboy. <laughs> and she took off because she knew the third rule, no loitering in the hallways. Here's what I know about hallways. You're not supposed to live there. You're not supposed to set up your home in a hallway season of your life. And some of you are making a temporary place your permanent address. You're making a temporary season the permanent statement over your life right now. 
Some of you are unpacking your life in a hallway and God says, no, you're transitioning through. You're not supposed to live here. But you know, the temptation is because we don't know where the end door is. We don't know where the exit is that we get so tired. You can get tired, especially if your hallway is a year, two years, three years. You're like, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to camp up here. And before you know it, you're tempted to pull up a chair and then you're tempted to get your recliner and then you're tempted to sit down and before you know it, you are sat down in the hallway and you've moved your family in and you moved your furniture and your pictures in and you're just like, yeah, well, this will do. It's not where I thought I'd be, but it'll do. And some of you right now are living in a hallway as if that's God's best for your life and God's like, I did not call you to live here. I called you to pass through here. I did not call you to stop here. She said, get me a donkey and make it a fast one and let's go. And today I need some of you to get back up, get out of your lazy boy seat spiritually and start moving towards the answer that God has for your future. And stop letting the enemy give you an address that God never gave you. When she reached, verse 27, the man of God at the mountain, she took a hold of his feet. I love this part. And Gehazi came over to push her out the way, but the man of God said, no, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Now, I love that line. Don't overlook it. See, this was the man that knew God's business. He would be a prophet to tell people what God was going to do. But on this particular occasion, God did not tell him what had gone down. And there's something in that I want you to understand. Because God needs you to get to a place in your journey where you will articulate what is going on in your own life. See, over in the doorway, when they said to her, when the man of God said, what can I do for you? She couldn't articulate what it was that was in her attic. She had no energy, no faith, no passion for it. And so someone else had to suggest what it was that she needed fulfilling. But when you walk your hallway and you begin to fight for your future, when you walk your hallway and you begin to stand ground in face of the enemy, when you walk your hallway and you're like, uh-uh, I am not gonna be ripped off by you enemy anymore. When you get to your hallway, when you find the right counsel, when they say to you, what's going on? You go, let me tell you. <laughs> Let me tell you exactly what's going on. I have been fighting the enemy. I've had a disaster happen, but I am here in front of you, man of God, because I need an answer and I need one now. You gotta find the words. And he said, come on, let's go. So they rode back and the story goes that he went back and resurrected the boy. And the miracle of resurrection took place in that room where she'd left the problem and God will resurrect any problem that you lay at his feet. But that's not the end actually of the story. We think the miracle is the end. Actually, it's not. Because not only are the doorways and not only are the hallways, but there's one other thing, it's called the gateway. Have you ever been through something in your life and you're like, what in the world was that about? Or is it just me? Have you ever been through a struggle or through a time where you're like, God, where were you? I, don't, I didn't feel you. I couldn't see you. Why did I go through that battle? I mean, I'm thankful I've come out the other end, but why? Why, God? Why? You know what I've discovered with God? None of us are immune from sorrow. But if we can have eyes to see it, God will take seed from every sorrow and He will plant it in your tomorrow. He'll extract something from the now pain and he'll put it into a promise for your future. He will not let anything be wasted or anything be squandered. He will retrieve from things when you don't even know it, a gift for your future. She was about to discover such a gift. Because in 2 Kings chapter 8, a little later on in her life, it wasn't immediate. And some of you are looking for the immediate reason now. And God's like, no, you don't know now. But when you get to your gateway, you will know. You don't know why you went through that battle, but you're gonna bump into the reason why I'm gonna use that battle. See, I don't know why I had to go through infertility, but now at the gateway of helping other couples break through in their infertility, I know now the seed from my sorrow is in somebody else's tomorrow. You don't always know it at the time, 
but you've got to keep traveling with God. Some of you have been through bankruptcy. Some of you have been through a broken marriage. Some of you have been through bereavement and loss. And God's like, I didn't send it to hurt you. I didn't send it, but I'm going to use it to build you. I'm going to turn around what the enemy meant for bad, and I'm going to use it for good. There's a gateway in your future. And what happens is, long story short, you can read it in 2 Kings 8. The king, after seven years of famine, she's had to leave her home, leave her family, leave, leave her friends, leave all of the stuff that they'd worked so hard for because there's a famine in the land. So she moves away for seven years and after seven years, she wants to go home. She wants to go back to her land. But she knows the only way that that can happen is if she goes and requests it from the king. And who is she to request from the king such a massive ask? There was no guarantee she would get anything back, let alone her house or her land. But she rocks up at the gateway of the king's palace. And just at the time as she shows up all these years later at the king's gateway, the king happens to be having a cup of tea with Gehazi. And he says at that exact moment to Gehazi, tell me some of the miracles Elisha did. And he begins to say, let me tell you one. There was this amazing moment when he raised a woman's son from the dead. And as he's saying those words, at the gateway he stood the very woman. And Gehazi at the corner of his eyes sees her and says, wow, she's here. This is the woman, he says in verse five, my Lord, this is the one whose son was restored. And the king asked the woman about it and she told him her hallway journey. And then the king said, wow, let me tell you what I'm gonna do for you. I'm gonna assign an official to your case personally. And I'm gonna give back everything that belonged to you, including all the income from your land from the day you left until the day that you have returned. I'm gonna make it all up to you. And let me tell you, don't stop before your gateway because your gateway is God's payback moment. And some of you are like, I don't get why I've gone through this. I don't get what's happened. Keep on moving because there's a gateway that only God Himself can orchestrate where your name will be on somebody's lips and favor will be expressed towards you and God will move in an almighty way. I tell you, God will not waste any season. So I don't know where this finds you today. Whether you locate yourself at a doorway and there's a dream that needs to come back out. Whether you find yourself in a hallway and you're like, I'm not sure I can make it and you're ready to camp up. Or whether you find yourself at the other side going, what was that all about? And you're about to step into a gateway. I don't know where this finds you, but God does. And I came all the way from England to say, keep moving, keep believing, keep stretching, keep saying, yes, God, I trust you, I believe you. And all across the room, time's gone, but I'm just saying, if you're in here this morning and you're in one of those places, I want you quickly to stand to your feet and I wanna pray over you. Come on, I'm gonna pray strength into you. I'm gonna pray hope into you. I'm gonna pray a tenacity into your spirit, whichever one you find yourself in. Yeah, pretty much as I thought, because we're all somewhere in this journey, right? We are, we're all somewhere in this journey. And if you feel comfortable, I'd love you to raise your hands because this is God now that's gonna do this, not me. And I want you, as you raise your hands, close your eyes and absolutely lean into God in this moment. Father, you see all these hands in every campus. Lord, you know every situation, you know it in the finest of details. You know the dead dreams, you know the brokenness, you know the confusion, you know the areas where we're not sure which way to go. God, you know our story, but God, you are the alpha and the omega of our lives. And so today we put this back in your hands. And God, we lift our eyes and we lift our hope and we say, God, our hope is in you. Our hope is in you. We put our problem back on the promise of your word. We put our stress into the peace of you, God. We trust you, God, in the areas where we don't understand. For God, you are the God of the doorway, the hallway, and the gateway. And I pray today, strength to every life, energy to every soul, passion to be reignited, dreams to live again. Oh God, we thank you that you have not finished yet and your word will be final in every circumstance. And all God's people said, amen and amen. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. 
and that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins, and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I want to encourage you to sign up for this class because we want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I'm so proud of you.